All right, welcome. This is a training about how to create an ecosystem restoration music festival. I have had experience of doing this on a scale of around 400 people at a festival in Spain called Regeneration Festival, and then a smaller gathering of about 80 people um, just for the day as a party in London. Both were ticketed events and there were a lot of, a lot, a lot of fun. Um, and then Misha has been working on two festivals. You wanna go ahead and briefly? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, hi everyone. So yeah, over the last uh, nine years, 10 years, we've been hosting two um, restoration festivals in particular. One is called the Reforest Fest, which is, um, happens in Africa's southernmost forest. It's a, a crown jewel in, uh, in uh, biomes in this area. Um, and there's trees there that are over a thousand years old. And there we've had over a, a thousand people. I think the most is we've had 1200 people and planted over 12,000 trees um over one event period so lots of energy really exciting um fairly stressful and with teams of uh, over 100 people too and then we've done a, a slower longer festival every year for since 2012 called the festival of action and that's more based on um, kind of a multi-pronged approach of planting trees and doing permaculture and natural building and uh, mural art projects. Uh, and it was based on kind of like a, uh, a satellite festival. So we wouldn't just be focused in one area, we'd be going out into various different parts in a village uh, or town and trying to achieve impact in, in, in a, broad, yeah, a broad spectrum. So that's the, the Reforest Fest and the, the Festival of Action. Um, yeah, should I go straight into the, to the why, um, Ash? Yeah, please do. We've prepared a presentation that has facts and figures and uh, snippets from all of the events that we've both organised and we're both going to lead on different slides and there'll be a chance at the end for you to ask questions. If a question comes up during the presentation, please feel free to just write it in the chat and we'll get to it. Uh, when the time comes. So did you cool. want to share your screen, Misha? Do you have the um, would you mind sharing yours and I'll, and then I can have it up on mine All right. just to, for me to look at. Cool, thank you. Yes. Um, great, so I think one of the critical questions in anything in life is just starting with the why factor. Um, it's oh, so sorry, I've done something silly and pressed the wrong button. Bear with me. I'm no gonna problem. Press that one. <laughs> right. Cool. Are you all still there? Yes. Give us a thumbs up. <laughs> Great. We Maybe we can shake it off a little bit. And then another thing we like to do when we're starting the day is we put our hands in the air. We go, and then we breathe out like lions and lionesses. <sighs> <laughs> Classic yogi breath. Great. So one of the first things that we like to do when we're starting oh, anything Lord. is really Look just to understand. Music festival. <laughs> oh, there's someone, <sighs> can, can you please mute? Yeah, that's another housekeeping. If you're not speaking, can you please mute for now? So one of the things that's obviously critical is that you understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I mean, in our uh, case, there were two interesting situations that were happening. One was we had this forest relic. It had been degraded over 200 years due to unsustainable agriculture. Um, and there just wasn't enough impact to conservation work that was happening in the area. And the people that were essentially supporting the forest system through protecting it with fire bricks didn't have the funding to be able to bring a lot of energy into the space. Um, the other festival that we've been hosting, there was a big fire that had gone through there. We had 80,000 hectares with the landscape that were burnt. And so it was easy to kind of hone down on like a principle, why would we be here? The why allows for us to start a concept note. It allows for us to land with sponsors and volunteers and local municipalities to get them on board and to make them believe in the vision that you believe in. 
Um, obviously, looking at where you want to do the event, um, I think there's a lot of trade-offs here. But the thing that we found is that you know, all over the world there are magical places, and somehow you need to work out how do you wrap your space so that it is seemingly magical. Um, and from our perspective, for instance, the, the first project I, uh, I mentioned, the Plopbos forest, it's Africa's southernmost forest. And you know, so that you have this element of magic that when you're putting it out into the world, you can capture that imagination. Um, and that, I suppose, brings people along for the journey and makes them uh, feel inspired. Um, knowing what you want to achieve by doing the work that you're doing. Um, for us, you know, you can, you can bed that in developing a concept note, looking at the impact side of things, doing an ecological survey. But I think there's also some fluffy things that are important to be able to lock in on. Um, you know, from the perspective of, we want to inspire people to reconnect with nature. And that uh, deciding that that's one of the things that you want to do will also then give you some direction of how are we going to um, design the program? How are we going to allow for people to spend time in nature and not just do the restoration work that they're going to be doing? So trying to understand like what is the vision? What is it, what is it that you're trying to achieve um, in order to get to a place of, um, yeah, I suppose having a, a succinct vision um, to drive this whole thing forward. Because like, from my perspective, I'm often the one that is on the telephone having to call partners, having to call um, uh, local municipalities to essentially get the buy-in. And when I've got a, um, when I'm armed with the, the right kind of vision where I feel confident what I'm trying to get across, it really does help that process. Um, and then these um, elements will essentially allow for you to get to a place of deciding who is it that's your audience. And that audience may be very varied. Um, it's important for you to kind of cast your mind back and, and see you know, who's visited your space before, who's worked with your organization before, and start to build these profiles. We generally have a profile like this in our communication strategy. Um, and what we will do is we'll, we'll pin maybe eight or 10 individuals, which would be like um, university student. She's 22 years old. She loves the environment. She's studying a science of sorts. Then recently retired, big into gardening, um, loves knowing the names of trees and plants. And, and so slowly but surely you can build an interesting profile of all the people that you are essentially gonna be presenting this event for so that when you get to the point of being able to present the event um, through your communications, you're, you know what kind of language, you know what kind of imagery, you know what the essence of your event presentation is gonna look like. Yeah, thank you. Should we move on to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the next point is about setting um, the parameters. So how many people do you want to invite is one of the first questions. Once you've worked out what your essence is, what your vision is, why, why are you doing this event? Um, is it because you want to bring loads and loads of people to the sites that you're working on so that you can get loads of restoration work done? Or is it that you want to bring people together so that they can network and interact with one another to build more of a movement around what you're doing? Um, what you want to, your event to achieve will influence the number of people that you want to come. Um, also thinking about how much your event is going to cost. If you want to have a smaller event that's a bit more um, high end, you could welcome fewer people but make the tickets a bit more expensive. Uh, and again, that depends on this these character profiles that Misha was just talking about. 
who who is your event for who do you want to attract that will then help you work out how many people you want to invite and how much your event is going to cost because it needs to be in a price range that will fit with the disposable income of the people that you're looking to attract to buy tickets um and how many tickets do you need to sell so you need to think about a lot of stuff that's going to come later in the presentation around what your program's going to be what sort of activities you want to do who you want to invite to be speakers and bands because that will uh, impact the size of your budget so you need to work out your budget and then you can work out what the carrying capacity is of the land as well because there are some ecosystems that are very fragile fragile mm -hmm. and bringing thousands of people there is going to be problematic you know if there are if there are very rare species that are going to be scared off by bright lights and loud music you need to work out what how many people your land could comfortably hold and that will do that will be to do with how fragile it is um so these are all things that you need to start thinking about when you're planning your event and the answers to them will become clearer as we go through the other steps around budget, permissions, that sort of thing. Cool, thank you, Ashley. Um, when we did our first uh, restoration festival of sorts, we didn't have any brand identity at all. Uh, I, I whipped together a poster next to no time and we just put it out to the world. And it, to be fair, it looked more like a corporate conference then something that was fun and engaging and, and was going to try and, you know, capture the, the essence of something that was a festival. Um, and after we did it for the first time, and you know, honestly, we've gone from this journey of 85 all at our first event to over 1200 people. There's been these iterations of learning and understanding and trying to work out like, how do we get to a place of positioning it so that when someone who's external to Green Pop sees it, they realize, hey, this is a festival. Their automatic um, visual is telling that story. So, I mean, you can find this online quite easily, but really it's important to, to first of all, hone in on what is the essence of what you're trying to create. You know, um, if I think about Green Pop, our essence as, a, as an organization is called fun environmentalism. So you find your essence as an organization or if you know it, and then you try and apply that into, well, what does the brand look like of this festival that you're going to do? Once you've worked out what that is, you'd be able to start creating a guide. And that guide, it's pretty straightforward. You need to have the right kinds of coloring, the right kinds of topography, um, and the right kinds of imagery. Um, and the benefit of having a guide like this ultimately allows for you to provide it to photographers, to videographers, to graphic designers, to uh, social media managers, to anyone that's helping you build the festival. And the challenge is, is if you don't have a strong starting point. And that strong part starting point can be as simple as three pages. This is the logo, this is how the logo is used. These are the colors we're happy to use. Um, this is the type of topography that we're using. Um, and then potentially also speaking a little bit to the type of language that we use. Um, for instance, Green Pop, we like to use non-extinction language. So we don't want to talk about the big scary facts of what's happening in the world, climate change, doom and gloom, we very much focus on the positive language. Um, and so if you go through that process, you're going to set yourself up a lot quicker for success in order to make it happen. I highly recommend that you look at um, some free platforms like Canva. They are really good at kind of giving you the nuts and bolts, the starting place of creating a brand guide um, and knowing what colors and what texts can work together by looking at a lot of the templates that are out there. But uh, as a starting point, what I would do is actually go out there, create a mood board, find the things that inspire you, that you love, uh, put that onto 
um, a, a presentation, speak it through with your team, and then try and find a comparable in Canva or, or get a professional graphic designer to, to pull that together. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did the same thing when we were creating our brand. We, we had a small budget of, I think, 200 euros, and we decided to find a, a graphic designer who was as local as possible to the area so that our festival was, was creating job opportunities for people in the area. And he asked us a load of questions about the sort of associations that we would make with our idea. Mm. Um, so we wanted to be wanted it to be vibrant. We wanted it to be really fun and, and energetic, the same as as what Misha said. And then, and we spoke about the sorts of people we wanted to come. Uh, we we told him about the place. We described it, and then he came up with various options that he felt um, encapsulated those feelings and then we picked the one that we like and often when you're working with a graphic designer you can you can choose when you're writing the contract the number of iterations that you want the graphic designer to go through so you could say we want three iterations for x amount of money meaning we want the graphic designer to go to go back to the drawing board three times before a final design is made. Yeah, and maybe just to end off with that, I found in my process that the easiest thing to do was to actually go out there and find festival posters that I really loved as a starting place. Mm. I just go find them. I say like, this speaks to me. It's got some really ne lovely nature options. It's got a really nice color palette. Uh, I love the font. Here's three or four posters that I really love. And then being able to provide that to a graphic designer to say something in this, like, I like these graphics, I like these fonts, I like this format or this layout. And often, as a, a cost saving exercise can be, graphic designer to just design the poster and then give you the elements. And once you have those elements, you're able to then push them into Canva. That's Canva with a C. Um, and then you can pretty much design anything that you, you would like. And I can put the, the link for Canva into to the chat once we're done. Something uh, we're going to move on next, uh, which is a lot less exciting uh, than the design process, uh, but very much necessary. And uh, definitely you'd get a, a sense of achievement uh, by completing it. Um, we had some tragic accidents that happened in South Africa, not at our projects, um, two years ago. And our permitting and kind of governance things went from a simple 20 page document to short of 100 pages. Um, and so I really cut my teeth on the process of trying to get my head around all the different elements that are necessary. I think your first port of call is get hold of the local municipality and find out what their requirements are. Generally, what you'll find is that they've got requirements depending on thresholds. So if you want 50 people, you don't need a permit. If you want 100 people, you've got a baseline permit. If you want 500 people, what you need is a lot. If you've got 10,000 people, they're gonna ask for uh, something that looks closer to a Bible. So first of all, ascertain what you need to do. I think there's some basic things that are always important. You need to have someone who's got basic um, uh, medical um, training as a, a level one uh, medic. Um, just so if something happens, if someone cuts themselves, someone has a cardiac, whatever it is, if there's a snake bite, depending on where you are, we know how to act and you've got a process to be able to act accordingly. I highly recommend that you get yourself um, fire hydrants. You never know what's gonna happen in a kitchen. We, at the end of an evening, people are sitting around, they're enjoying a fire together, and maybe someone's had too many drinks, um, maybe a wind, uh, a gust of wind blows up. And so it's important that you not just have fire hydrants, but you also have a procedure and that there's always someone that is taken responsibility for being sober so that you're ensuring that the the baton of responsibility is held because as part of this permitting pro process and governance 
is you need to have liability insurance and your liability insurance is going to count for nothing if everyone's even had a couple of beers you know you could be at the end of the day like oh we're all celebrating here it's been so fun and so wonderful let's have a beer and then something happens and actually it all was very innocent but because there was no sober responsible person that lands up being problematic we often have neighbors in the work that we're doing and often the neighbors are very supportive but being a festival uh, it's possible that the sound can be loud and maybe quite invasive um, so it's important to first of all understand where your neighbors are at invite them to come and be, participate but what may happen is depending on the size and the type of amplification that you're going to be doing you might need a sound strategy and a sound permit. In South Africa, because legal system and uh, the process is a little bit hazy, I was able to do that myself. I got online, I worked it out. You know, the mathematics behind it was relatively simple, but essentially it's working out if I'm putting out X amount of decibels um, and I know that the distance from where our front of our stage is to the next homestead is this far, the maximum amount of decibels I can put out is uh, X. And so in order for us to get a permit, I need to be able to present that to local municipalities and ensure that they uh, feel that we've done our due diligence on ensuring that we're not upsetting, not just all the neighbors, but also there may be a local um, nature reserve. And you know, if you've got loud strumming into the night, uh, those uh, the biodiversity hotspots aren't necessarily wanting uh, uh, all the human noises coming their way. Um, I think it's also important to try and understand the, the importance of having a ECO offices, ushers, emergency procedure people. Uh, what we generally do is from the, time the first team member arrives so the last person leaves there are people that are on site that are essentially not top management so i'm not the person responsible and my production team are not responsible it's essentially if something goes wrong they will know that this is the way we need to guide people as an emergency meeting point they will know that you're not supposed to park your car there because there are sensitive species over there, or you're not supposed to light independent fires because we might start a much bigger fire. So what you'd need to do is create a strategy of the basics that everyone who's on site has agreed to, and you can put that forward in your pre-departure emails. You can mention that uh, on arrival, but to have those people that really become kind of the good cop, bad cop, which takes away a little bit of responsibility for you, but also allows for the, you to have much more eyes and kind of a collective knowledge around the things that are important to, to capture while you're on the ground. Um, this is quite a broad subject and I've got a fair amount of uh, writing about this. I think it's largely going to be um, location specific, but if anyone is interested, I'm happy to share um, an open document which has got a, a quite a long, um, uh, yeah, a robust conversation starter to, to get you th through the full throes of this. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a tricky one and it's important that you really bite down into it. Mm -hmm. Ash, I'm going to hand it over to you for infrastructure needs and capacity. Okay, so you need to start thinking about what sort of infrastructure you're going to need. Hopefully you'll have some idea now of what sort of event you want to host, who you want to invite, what you want the event to do for the world, uh, and how many people you're thinking of inviting. So then you need to think about, okay, so what infrastructure do we need to, to serve these people um, in the way that we we dream of. For the Regeneration Festival, we used these stretch tents, which not only work very well, um, but they also look very aesthetically beautiful and natural. 
and they're quite quick and easy to put up as well. We found a local Spanish company again, as much as possible, local local businesses. Um, we were lucky that we had some funding up front from someone who was involved in the team. And so obviously this is ideal scenario, but if you need to find other ways that are cheaper, that's, that's totally understandable as well. So this was the kitchen area. Um, we found a woman here, a local lady who ran a catering business and she focuses on slow food. So all of the food that she gave out in her kitchen was from the region and all grown organically or regeneratively. So that's what I mean here by find companies that, that align with your vision and ethics as much as possible. Um, for the music, we had another one of these stretch tents and a stage and all of the music equipment. And again, we, we found a local sound engineering company that does events and told them uh, what we wanted and they told us what we needed which was really helpful because we weren't quite sure um but we said we want this many people to come uh these are the sorts of bands that we're thinking of inviting these are their instruments etc and they were like okay you're going to need this lighting you're going to need this um sound equipment etc this is the cost lighting is important to think about you can see here that we had some um we've got some what are these lights called again Oh, festoon. Festoon lighting, yeah. They're quite popular at festivals because they look really nice. They're easy to put up. Um, we didn't really think about the lighting properly until until a couple, maybe a week before the event when we were walking around, things were already in place and we were like, hang on a minute, it's really dark in the areas where there aren't any tents. You need lighting to, to lead people from the main kind of, eating, hanging out, music, workshop areas to the where people are camping, for instance, um, because it can get, well, you're just setting yourself up for people to fall over and get lost and whatnot. Otherwise, that's something that we hadn't thought about until the last minute. And hopefully we, luckily we found a festine company pretty quickly. Uh, your workshop space, how big do you want it to be? Um, you need to think about tables and chairs, you know, how many people are going to be eating, um, will they want to sit down, stand up, you kind of have to just project your mind forward into what you think the event will look like, run through the event in your head, and then think, okay, we're going to need X, Y, Z, make a list, source, find companies that you can source it from, create a budget, um, toilets and showers, obviously, a lot of the places where restoration festivals happen are off grid. So compost toilets are an obvious one. Then you have to think about what you're gonna do with them after the festival. Um, you could build your own or you could work with a company that will bring them in and take them away again. Uh, it depends on what the land is used for for the rest of the year. You know, do you own it? Would it be useful to have those toilets at another time? Uh, you have to think about what you're going to do with the with the human manure as well. Are you just going to dig deep holes and let it go into the ground and compost on its own? Are you going to move it? That again will all depend on your specific context. Um, for showers, we just use those shower bags that you can buy that are solar charged. Um, maybe you want to say how you did your showers? Um, cool. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we've had various iterations of building showers and making um, different types of setups work. Um, we found that the a donkey boiler can work really well. So that's getting like an oil drum, um, putting a fire under the oil drum, sending the water through that. Um, and essentially the heat of the oil drum pushes it back into a pipe. Um, and yeah, a lot of the places that we're doing tree planting, have got a tremendous amount of non-indigenous vegetation. So we've got all the surplus biomass um, and that's quite an efficient way. Um, but I know of people that are making um, compost showers even by having a, a um, circular kind of grid of copper piping inside a compost heap and you can get some retained heat, um, heat for a long period of time. Um, we've also built 
um, long drop toilets, composting toilets, um, kind of grand thrown toilets that look over the wilderness. Um, and I have to say that composting toilets can be very efficient. Um, the ones that we've been building are the ones that kind of come with a, we have these wheelie bins, which are maybe a 400 liter bin. And so they last a long time, um, especially if you have a separator attached to them. They take forever to fill up. And then we just strap uh, the tops and push them to, to the back of the nursery. Um, and a year later, we actually use that to pot out baby trees. Um, and we found that it's actually such a fantastic use of um, resources and bringing it back into the system. Um, and then maybe just on the on the tents, just to lean into what you were talking about. So I personally set up a lot of the tents that we build and stretch tents are a fantastic win for weather, um, for protecting against sun, wind protection. They can be quite expensive though. Um, and what I found works really well is seeing if there's a way that you can lean into businesses or um, other festivals that own their own infrastructure that are not hosting events at the same time as you, year as you would be hosting an event. And I'll give you an example. We work with Africa Burn here in South Africa. And every year they give me a host of tents and I've just got to pay for the insurance on those tents and essentially pay for setting them up myself. And so I've worked out how to set them up. It took me a couple of times, but I know how to set them up without them coming crashing down. You do, however, in normal circumstances, need an engineer to sign off on it because the pressure on, uh, you can see the center pole there, the pressure on that center pole is pretty intense. And if there's a wind that picks up and the, the whole tent starts billowing, you can cause a lot of damage and you can hurt people quite badly. So it's important that whoever's setting it up really knows what they're doing. Um, so if I could give you one piece of advice in the company or a group of people that like setting up stretch tents and uh, it is quite an addictive process. You know, you can almost build a village by virtue of setting these up. It feels quite exciting starting with the kind of a, a zero infrastructure landscape coming in, putting up the tent, putting up flags and bunting and lighting and ta-da, it's all there. Um, and just seeing if there's some sort of exchange that you can do if you don't have budget. I mean, if you can pay for it, then definitely get someone to do it for you. Yeah. Yeah, there are certainly are lots of people out there who love going from festival to festival and helping mm. be the build crew. Mm. Um, and in, in return, you you feed them and house them whilst they're doing the build process. Uh, that's, there were some people that came to the Regeneration Festival who love doing that sort of thing. And that's a lot of what they do, um, but we'll get to that when we talk about the build later. Mm. Uh, utilities, yeah. So what I was saying about lighting, um, this is pretty much all a repeat actually of what I just said. Uh, in terms of water, we ordered large water tanks and filled them up and then put them around the site so that there were there was drinking water available. Um, that was our off-grid solution. Do you have another method that you used, Misha, for getting drinking water to people? Um, I mean, we've literally had every kind of solution under the sun from bringing big bowsers in and having massive water tanks, big plastic uh, kind of jerry can water tanks. Um, we generally dot 25 liter tanks, both in the field where we're planting and in the campsites. Um, and sometimes we've had situations where we've been quite remote, where we've had to kind of depend on river water, which has been downstream of villages and a little bit iffy in terms of E. coli, and then having to boil it and um, put chlorine in. So I think it's important to really consider your location um, when you're thinking about um, this kind of thing, because a water, supply of water and having water security is really a make or break in terms of making sure that you have a successful event. Um, we had one instance where we had water run out halfway through an event. Um, the only water that we had available 
was um, um, water from um, a municipal, but we had to drive it in, in a, with a water tank every second day. And the water that was coming out of the taps was from a local dam and there was like worms in the water and all sorts. So it, it landed up being a real challenge and trying to, yeah, trying to save a project event when you have a water issue can be uh, incredibly uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is also the option of, I know I've worked at another festival, not one that I set up, but one that I've worked at, where they collect rainwater in these huge rainwater catchment tanks throughout the year, because they have quite high rainfall where they're based. And then they got the water tested um, before the event to make sure that it was clean enough. And then they used, they just used that. Mm. Um, that's another option. So yeah, Misha is now going to talk about the difference between pre-programming your event or doing it collaboratively. Perfect. So we've got a fairly uh, big social media following between our different platforms, probably about 75,000 people. Um, and so when we put out word, we generally get a lot of feedback, which is fantastic. Um, I don't know if everyone's got that resource, but one thing is that's great about things like Facebook is that you can pay for advertising. Um, and in paying for advertising, what it allows you to do is create, craft an advert that says, we're hosting a tree planting festival or a restoration festival. We'd like to sign up bands. And then being open and honest from the beginning, you know, we, this is very much a participatory event. We are looking to co-create the space. If you come, we will feed you, we will house you, um, and we will give you a tra travel um, stipend. And that may be the way you want to do it. Another way that you can do it, um, which you could add to this or do it separately, is come up with an idea of the budget that you have and then looking at your audience profile, try and work out how do you uh, leverage the right kinds of bands that are nearby or internationally that are coming through that area um, and get them on board. And what we found is that it's quite effective to, to spend a lot of money on one or two bands that are real draw factors, and then spend a little bit of money on just incentivizing grassroots bands, bands that are just starting off, or mom and shop kind of garage bands uh, that are more of a weekend thing and that can bring a bit of fun. And then a DJ or two also helps because ultimately with a DJ, um, you can kind of set a tone. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a banging house music. You can have melodic music, you can have journey music, you can have all sorts of really gentle kinds of music um, but the infrastructure doesn't cost that much the challenge with bands is that the more you pay the band the more expensive it gets from a production point of view um, and you know you think okay i'm going to be spending a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or five thousand dollars on a band but well, you're going to spend double that on the production and so when you're building a budget, it's important that you're understanding that uh, these amounts can expand quite dramatically. One of the ways that we've managed to work that out is by partnering up with um, audio colleges. So um, schools that essentially teach young people how to be um, in charge of musical events and they love the, the uh, hands-on experience and they often have their own equipment. Um, and then there's obviously the burn style, which is like hyper participatory. And there's various ways you can do that. So you can put it out to the people who are buying tickets and say, um, what is your magic power? You know, if you were a superhero, what is the gift that you would bring? Um, is it a talk? Is it a workshop? Is it something that's musical? Is it daily dancing? Um, or, and then you can filter that into a program that you structure. I do recommend that you ask for some sort of reference or uh, a link or uh, some sort of something that you can see the caliber of the individual because we have had situations where people have put themselves forward to something and then they haven't quite been that or they've just been really novice 
and we put them at kind of like almost star of the show because they kind of built themselves up a lot. And then everyone's expecting something really mind blowing and it wasn't that. So, you know, I think everyone can be invited, but it's your responsibility to curate that journey, to see how are we gonna manage this energy? We've all had a hard day's work. We're all wanting to rest, or maybe we all did a hard day's work yesterday. And now we're having a day full of workshops and talks and things that are entertaining. Um, who's gonna get center stage and who's gonna maybe have these micro breakaway type experiences. And then the last way you can do it is really just throw it to the wind. You set up a couple of spaces, which allows for anyone to step into those spaces and you have a board. And on that board, you can say it's the green stage and the blue stage and the walking stage and the, the meditation stage. And there's all the times that are available and there's just cue cards and people can write their name on the cue card and they can write what they're wanting to achieve. And they can put their name in that slot and then that slot is taken and it's up to them to advertise it and they can honk their horn and walk around and tell people i'm going to be doing a talk it's about x y and z i encourage you to come along um, and all of these things can work and, uh, and some of them can work um together um and and you can even like we we have quite a few different scenarios where we try and make it participatory so we have an open mic experience for kids. You know, kids love to show their talent and it's a nice way to make it come alive. And so you could have an hour where the kids all know that they um, can prep a song and bring it and, and showcase their song. And it's just so heartwarming to see something like that. Or you can uh, pose a question to your audience before the event. Um, and it could be an interesting question like the meaning of happiness. You know, we've had sessions where we call it Cat Stevens and conspiracy theories. And we say, like, let's talk about vaccines. Let's talk about COVID-19. Let's talk about all the stuff that people have differing opinions about. And we can throw it into a melting pot and have a really good facilitator allowing for everyone to have a voice. And that can really help um, creating a sense of community. And it's not just... Um, this uh, spectator and server type relationship, which can happen with a, a festival. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. You're welcome to go on to the next slide. Okay, so I spoke a little bit earlier about food and catering. Um, and mm -hmm. what is really beautiful about an event like this is, and what we really wanted to do, this goes back to the first slide about the why, with the Regeneration Festival, what we really wanted to do was showcase the products that were grown in that region and instill a lot of local pride in the people that live there because it's an area that's very, not only ecologically degraded, but socially degraded as well. Um, obviously the two are linked. And so a lot of the people that live in this region uh, are, you know, some of the only ones left. A lot of young people have left. And so we wanted to reinstill this sense of pride in, in still remaining and living in this place. And it's a really big agricultural zone for Europe. It produces a lot of Europe's fruit and veg. So yeah, that was one of the things that we really wanted to highlight. And because there were so many people coming from across Europe and even from across the world to this event, it was a chance for them to the people that live there to, to show off what they grow and also to instill pride in, in regenerative agriculture as well. It, 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 the, we wanted the event to be uh, an encouragement for farmers to farm regeneratively by showing that there are people that are really into that as an idea. So yeah, like I said, this lady in Kana with her local um, slow food catering company she did all of the all of the food you have to make sure that they have a health and safety certificate but if they're a professional company then they they will and she did a lot of local dishes um to show off the cuisine of the area as well again fitting in with that sense of pride uh you could also do the food yourself if you want to, if you knew, if you have people in your team or you want to work with volunteers to do the cooking, 
that could be a way of of making it a bit cheaper um but instead we went for the easier option of bringing a company in so that they could make an income from from the festival uh we charged them a pitch fee which basically means they paid us an amount of money to uh to be there and then any money that they made they kept um you could do that or you could just ask for a cut of their profit instead or you could ask for both. It's up to you as to what you think would work best for your situation. Um, there is a chance that it could go wrong though. Um, it kind of went a little bit wrong for us. And it's good to also talk about the things that didn't go right. Mm -hmm. We found this company, I uh, can't remember what it was called now, but they make meals from food waste. And we were like, oh great, you know, they. Uh, were local and we were like yes this is a really sustainable company let's bring them in we didn't taste their food before uh before <laughs> the event which we should have done because it wasn't it just wasn't very nice um, <laughs> unfortunately and so a lot of people were like Ugh, what is this and um it was a bit too late for us to do anything about it so that's something I recommend you do. Try and taste the food of the companies that you're that you're bringing in to feed people. Um, it goes without saying as well that you need to think about the sort of packaging that they give their food in. Uh, try and get them to buy biodegradable packaging. Um, I've worked at festivals before where in order to ensure that that definitely does happen and that the food company doesn't cut corners, you you buy the biodegradable cups, bowls, plates, etc., spoons, and you give them to the company so that it's guaranteed that they're not going to come with with throwaway plastic stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, obviously, because all of that's compostable, if you're making compost on site you can just add all of that stuff in as carbon material, which is uh, putting the resource back into the, the system. And in terms of times, we had like a set breakfast time, a set lunch time, and a set dinner time in the schedule so that people could eat together, um, which was really nice actually, because it meant that rather than people just going and getting food whenever they wanted, because we were a smaller event, it encouraged you to get to know the other people in the festival because you sat next to them at mm. dinner. Yeah. Misha, did you want to add anything else? Yeah, I mean, we so we tried various iterations to this. Um, we brought in caterers, we bought all the food and fed everyone ourselves. Um, out of one kitchen, which we kind of kitted and managed in the whole shebang. Um, what I have found works quite well is we uh, get a caterer, um, which we essentially arm with a kitchen, um, a mobile kitchen, um, and we arm them with local produce and large bags of legumes and grains and all the things that you're going to be cooking up. And, and that is specifically for your team. So you can keep it cost effective. There's always a lot of food available. Um, and essentially, uh, you know, you know, for the team to be eating the food of um, the vendor, uh, it then becomes quite um, time um, inefficient for the vendor because they're having to make team food. Um, and it can become quite costly for you. So to, to kind of separate our team from participant or event goer, and then for the vendors, what we'd recommend is we got a vendor for every hundred people that came on and um, an alternative vendor too. So you could have someone who's doing like falafels and hummus and la la la. And then also like someone who's got a snack bar or a juice bar or something that's like quite nicely um, complimentary, but it isn't another food stuff. And they're not starting to, um, uh, what's the word, um, cannibalize each other. The way that we got around um, packaging is we actually make it a zero packaging festival. So everyone's asked to bring a knife, a plate, a, a fork, a spoon, etc. Mm -hmm. And we've set up um, wash stations, which are 
cleaned every hour. Um, and then there's uh, essentially a stand where people can rent knife, fork, plate, spoon um, for the same amount that it costs us to buy it. And they get the, the money back if they bring us the goodies back. So by the end of it, we have zero packaging from um, the, that side of the food things. Obviously some food stuffs, you know, the bulk bags of grains or whatever, those will come in packaging, but really great to be able to serve something to someone on a plate and have them hold the responsibility of their own meal all the way to the end. Um, and we found it works, you know, we've done it with a thousand people before. There is always a few outliers. There's a couple of people that maybe leave their plates and someone has to wash it. Um, and it's important that we have staff that are able to, to manage that side of things. Yeah, thank you. Should we move on to the next one? Yeah. Great. So accommodation, this is the kind of thing that can really make or break your events. Um, you know, we've had situations where we've set up beautiful glamping, really lovely lighting, personalized name tags on tents. Um, and then we've had situations where um, we just weren't going for the same market, um, but the rain pulled in and the tents weren't as waterproof um, and it landed up being quite challenging. So it's important first to kind of understand what are you trying to achieve through the accommodation and how are you going to do it? Um, and what we found works really well is trying to position your tickets in a few different tiers. One is allowing for people to bring their own tent. They can set it up, they fend for themselves. Um, and that way they can come in at a, a less expensive ticket. Then setting up tents for people where they just bring their own bedding. So you have a tent and a mattress and there is a string of lights that run through this tented area. Um, and you can even put a stretch tent over it so you create this nice little uh, micro environment. So if weather does come through, you know that everyone's protected under there and no one's gonna come to you halfway through the festival and the rain chucks down and says, hey, you rented us a tent, it's full of um, rain and you know, you've got bigger things to think about than someone with a, a tent. And another way, to bring value to the local community is looking at homestays. And we've done this many times. We'd essentially be advertising the tickets, then underneath tickets it says accommodation. And in that accommodation, it'll be like, the, here are the various types of um, other accommodation available in the Valley um, and kind of uh, based on least expensive to most expensive. Because some people do want to splash out. Some people would be happy to drive in every morning the five minutes from a local accommodation down. And what that does is that it makes um, the festival experience more inclusive because now what you're doing is you're bringing in the local community to allow for them to get some of the value out of the festival. Um, the other thing is that it actually reduces the pressure on your services. You know, if you have 20% or 30% of your festival goes all staying off site, what it allows for is less pressure on toilets, less pressure on the water consumption that needs to be done. Um, and I think it just kind of spreads out the resources a little bit better. So I highly recommend looking at the various different iterations that you can work out in order to give people a mixed opportunity of um, the types of accom accommodation available. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We also had the option we 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 linked people to hotels in the area um for those who wanted to stay inside. <laughs> uh we had a an issue with the bell tents that we hired because we hired them from uh Valencia, which is an area nearer to the coast where it's a lot warmer where the, where the festival was is a thousand meters, a thousand meters, a thousand, yeah, uh, elevated. So it's quite a lot colder, especially at night. And so we told the glamping company, you know, this is how cold it's going to get. The the actual festival it ended up being way colder at night than we expected it to be. Mm -hmm. The bedding that was provided by this glamping company, who are used to like you know doing events on the beach where it's a lot warmer, the bet all they really had was thin blankets. So people had paid, you know, top dollar for glamping and they were freezing cold. Um, 
that was obviously a big lesson. We all, we had to rush to a shop and buy way more blankets after the first night so that, that, <laughs> that they wouldn't be too cold. Um, that's something to think about. Make sure that where, where you're getting the glamping tents from, make sure that they really, really know what the temperature is at night so they bring the right the right bedding for your guests. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, this is an interesting conversation. I mean, essentially it's around like, how do you ensure you get people to the events? And there's various types of draw cards outside of ensuring that you get the language right. And, you know, the whole visual appeal is uh, you've nailed. Um, and one of the things that I found works quite well outside of the, the headline bands and speakers, which is listed here, is looking at um, organizations that have the pool of groups in the area. So for instance, you may be able to um, look at local universities that have a conservation society or a birding society or a green society. Um, in my um, example, I would give, we have an organization that deals with women empowerment um, and they essentially take women from low income communities and they give them an opportunity to do things that are different because they're all stuck in this very isolated space um, township in South Africa and they don't really get to go into other interesting places. Another one is called Activate Leadership and they are a social entrepreneurship incubator organization um, and they like to marry the principles of um, environmentalism with social entrepreneurship but a lot of the people that are in this incubation period don't quite understand the full grasp of what environmentalism looks like and so having the opportunity to come to a restoration camp or restoration festival gives them this like deeply immersive experience around um, what restoration looks like and what environmentalism looks like. Um, and it's not just kind of like this poster green piece, that's what environmentalists do. So yeah, thinking about the types of groups and they can be quite broad, you know, they could be businesses that are Minded. There could be a local TEDx group that are similarly minded, um, education, schools. Um, so what we've done in the past is we would get uh, an intern or, or someone that's happy to tick through a, a lot of contacts and make different spreadsheets. Um, and those spreadsheets would then allow for one of us to send an email um, and essentially uh, direct that email. So if it's there's 20 yoga studios in our in, in the 50 kilometer radius or 50 mile radius, let's speak to the yoga studios and get them to activate their yogi people to come and join and speak their language. We're hosting a restoration festival. Part of yoga is to give back. I can't remember what the term is, but there's a term for it. Um, this is a fantastic way for your yogis to reconnect with nature would you be open to sharing this with your yoga community? We have someone who's a speaker and would be happy to come around and speak to one of your classes. We have a poster. You're welcome to put it up at the class. And we find it works really well because, you know, if you make sure that you link the dots with the right types of groups, um, you know, so it's obviously not the local uh, um, firing range. Um, or the local supermarket. It's the types of people that would be interested in restoration as a concept and finding ways that you can link the dots, uh, link the musical dots, link, link the wellness dots, link the environmental dots and get them to be inspired to, to take a risk and, and come and check it out. Mm. And you can do things like, you know, if, we, if five of your people book, we'll give you a free ticket and uh, that might incentivize them to, to want to be part of, you know, gaining that momentum and, and getting people enthused about being part of um, your mission. Should we, would you like to add to that, um, Ash? No, I think you covered it. I mean, what I wanted to say is already written here in the text about think headline bands or speakers that are well known and have a fan base and following because that that helps to bring people in who would want to come to the festival just to see their favorite band. Um, yeah. 
So then we get to the point where we can start thinking about putting a schedule together. We had uh, three main days during our event, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. People arrived on Thursday from, I think it was 4 p.m. and they left on Monday morning and there were still a few people left on Monday afternoon, but that's quite a common way of doing festivals and it works well. So you'll see across the top in green, we have one, two, three, four, five, six areas. These were the workshop spaces or the different parts of the festival site um, that had quite clear identities. We had quite fun, we had quite a lot of fun inventing um, the names and, and essences of these different places. So there's a place called La Botica, which we turned into a sort of big botanarium greenhouse sort of vibe and um, a lot of the stuff around growing and planting and seeds and food and that sort of thing was in there. Um, there was a place called Alchemia which is Spanish for alchemy where a lot of stuff around transformation was being discussed both social transformation, composting, you know things that turn one thing into another thing. Um, so had, we had fun with creating those and then we decorated them um, in a way that made sense for those ideas. And then we, yeah, down the side, we had different time slots when different things were happening. Um, every morning there was a yoga session that happened in this really beautiful area of trees uh, by a lake that people could drop into. Um, all of the workshops that we organized, workshops and uh, music and stuff was all included in the ticket. Whereas some other festivals, they'll put on extra things that are not included in the ticket price that you need to pay an extra amount for. It's up to you if you want to do that or not. If, if they're really special things that are quite expensive, you could, you could, there's a festival I know in the UK that does that where they put on feasts with professional chefs um, and they're, they're an extra cost. But again, it depends on who you're attracting and whether or not they'd be interested in that. When we were blocking things in, we were trying to make sure that we had, we didn't have too many things happening at the same time that were uh, too similar. Um, and we made sure that there was a set amount of time for lunch, dinner and breakfast that I mentioned earlier, and a set time where the bands were on, a set time when the DJs were on, um, you can see there are band names in different times as well. You can start off with a schedule that's a little bit more vague. And then as the event comes closer, when you filled in all of the, all of the gaps, the people that have bought tickets, you can send the finalized schedule to nearer the time so that they get more excited um, as, it, as it comes along. Did you wanna mention anything else about scheduling? Oh, I missed something, sorry. Every morning was the restoration slot. So you see here the this line, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, where it says 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, we had a two and a half hour restoration slot, which is obviously it's a restoration festival. We didn't want it to be too early in the morning so that people were still hung over and asleep, but we also didn't want it to be too late in the afternoon when it got really hot. So that was the slot that we chose. Um, keeping it at the same time every day meant that people weren't scratching their heads and asking around as to what time it was. We also gave a printed handout of the schedule to every person when they came in, uh, when they registered to arrive at the festival and we had printed out large card versions of them in set places so that you could always go and have a look. Um, at what was happening at specific times. Anything to add, Misha, or shall I move on? Cool, thanks, Ash. Um, yeah, I, I suppose the thing with the scheduling we found is that it's going to be very site-specific, um, and much like you mentioned, it can get quite hot. I'm a little bit more of a uh, hard work driver, um, uh, which has kind of backlashed a few times. So we try and get going around eight in the morning. We'd 
plants until lunch, have a brief lunch, um, and then get everyone up and dancing again and enthused, and then go back until almost sunset. Um, you know, so we find that it's possible to plant in the region of 100, uh, of 10 trees per person. So if there's a 100 people, you can plant 1,000 trees. You plant, if you're at 1,000 people, you can plant 10,000 trees. But that includes the people who are passing the trees and the people that are putting on the sunblock and the people that are drumming the drums. And so, you know, some people are planting 20 trees and some people are pushing a wheelbarrow full of juice to keep people hydrated. Um, so trying to find the balance of your own schedule may take some time. Um, it's a, I've always found that it's a bit of a, it's a moving target and it needs to consistently be adapted according to what opportunities come your way and the time of year that you're doing it, when sunrise is, what type of weather is happening um, and not ever seeing the schedule as a stagnant thing. It needs to be very much alive. Yeah. And maybe moving on to the work itself, hey? Mm -hmm. So, the first thing that we do is we create a strategy of what restoration work needs to be done. And there we'd work with one of my program managers, with whoever um, the, the site manager is, and we create something that's a fairly robust plan. And then we try and whittle it down to something that's very crystal clear and easy for a regular punter to understand because the belief is that you need everyone to feel like they're part of this process. They understand a little bit of the science and they're not just kind of flinging plants into the ground. Um, and that you can seed to them um, leading into the events, you know, giving it to them in the pre-departure information, some interesting reading that gives them some context and allows for them to feel enthusiastic about the quality um, side of things because you what you don't want is it to become this kind of restoration race where it's just about how fast we can get the plants into the ground or how fast we can dig the swale and then the swale is kind of like this dinky little thing and it doesn't really do anything so you really need to be emphasizing the value of the work and the and the technical background to the work without making it over comprehensive um, and then understanding what tools do you need and you know i've made this mistake a few times where we arrived on site and the tools weren't quite correct because i didn't understand the landscape properly and we host four or five restoration type events every year um, but the difference between here and 10 kilometers down the road or one kilometer down the road can be an entirely different landscape and so understanding those landscapes are critical to understanding those tools um, and I'll give you an example. In one year, we managed to plant um, 9,000 trees, about 700 people. The following year, we had the same amount of people and we planted maybe 2,500 trees less. And that was because the entire site was completely overrun with grass and we had to hand pull and hoe grass out before we could actually plant the, uh, the plant species that we were wanting to put in. And the issue was that we'd walked the site um in a time that was at the back end of summer and so the grass hadn't established itself and we weren't fully aware of how the landscape was going to change between the months of doing the planting and not doing the planting um and so it's important that you've got your eye on the ball and you realize well you know if we need to can we get a digger loader in here or can we get uh, a lawnmower at least just to cut the bulk of the organic material down um, so just having a good understanding of that. Then the rest of the things, there's some really great tools in South Africa that we use. Um, and I'm sure there's even more modern tools um, in Europe and the States. But things that we've really enjoyed using are things like um, a top or a sail. And that's just a big uh, square piece of fabric with handles on it. And it allows for you to move around a huge amount of mulch at the same time. You can have four people in each corner um, holding the top. It can be two by two meters wide. So a really big piece of fabric and you can move things across the landscape really efficiently, a lot more efficiently than loading things into um, a wheelbarrow. Um, 
spades we encourage people to bring their own spade and label their own spades but what we generally do as well is we would have one spade for every three four people um, and then a couple of other tools um, hose and picks and earth moving things and trowels for youngsters or people that are don't have as much energy um, and so by having an assortment of different types of tools um, you know i think different people can then easily flow into the work that suits their fitness level suits their interest um, and allows for you to get the most of everyone that's on the landscape because what you don't want to do is just have shovels um, when it's not just a, a shovel kind of job your toolbox really needs to represent a spectrum of tools which will allow for you to do as much as possible on the landscape yeah I clicked by accident and it moved the slide forward when you were talking about restoration stuff. Sorry, I felt like such a noob when it comes to tech and stuff. One simple click and it all goes wrong. Um, I'm thinking about some lessons restoration wise from our festivals. Uh, we had music playing whilst the restoration was mm -hmm. happening. So that people were dancing and digging at the same time. And that was one of the main things that we were really shouting about was the idea of the, this was a festival where you plant the beat and the music that we chose, um, we welcomed in a band who had taken sound samples from the land and then they'd mixed the sound samples in to the tunes that they were playing. So they were like sounds of the, the toads in the pond and the sounds of spades and you can get really creative with it, which was which was really fun and, and everyone was so happy and excited and to see hundreds of people all planting uh, aromatic native shrubs together whilst dancing was we were like yes this is why we did this <laughs> it was a really good feeling i'm aware of time so let's move on to staffing needs i think mm. you were going to do this one misha was i okay fantastic <clears throat> so yeah look i mean there's nothing more critical than having the right team um, i've had great teams and i've had average teams and it can really make or break yourself and the project and your stress levels. Um, and so for mapping out a good team, um, and that team doesn't have to be made up only of paid people. Um, what we found works really well is we put out an advert that says, we're looking for volunteer team and we're looking for paid team. And these are the types of criteria we're looking to uh, achieve through this team. You know, you need admin people, you need people that understand managing people. You need people that can manage stock. You need um, people that understand working in landscapes. Um, our facilitation team in itself is probably about 25 people strong um, because each of the planting teams would be a planting leader, a planting assistant, um, a quality control manager, fund police manager. And so that it isn't all on the shoulders of one person. So understanding how do you set up your team and how do you ensure that there's a captain for each team and they'll be answerable. Um, what we do find is it's important to have key people in certain areas who are paid and they're paid well enough. Um, they're not, uh, yeah, they're, if you, if you don't have those people, then what can happen? And, or if you have those people and they're not paid, then the sense can be, well, I'm not getting paid for this. So I'm not really open to having this level of responsibility. Uh, so if you have a paid person and maybe an assistant underneath that person that's also paid and they have maybe two volunteers or 20 volunteers that are working under them, regardless of what it is, whether it's in the entertainment space or the food space or the build space or ticketing or communications, whatever it is, but they know that they've got a line manager and they know they've got a strategy of what they're trying to achieve. Um, and then, you know, it's a journey for these folk that are coming and joining in. And the whole idea with restoration and environmentalism is if it's not fun, no one's going to want to come back. So find ways to make people feel like they're part of something. They need to feel that kind of togetherness. 
Um, and what we'd often do is we'd have a pre-meeting um, where we'd rally people up. Um, we'd send out some cool emails with fun widgets and whatnot. We'd get people to the pre-meeting. Um, we'd have one of our team do something that's inspirational to that makes people feel like they're part of something that's it's a movement. It's not just another event. Um, you'd speak through the plan for the weekend or for the week or the two weeks or whatever it is. So people have the, they can visualize it. So when they're on the ground, they're not just kind of hitting the ground running and they don't know what to expect. Um, and then when it comes to the event itself, to try and manage the energy by having um, enough staff welfare. You know, we throw staff coffee at the end of the day, everyone gets a beer um, to manage the timing. Um, uh, shifts are incredibly important. People can't work 16 hour shifts three days in a row because they're not gonna like you at the end of it. Um, and so making sure that you're managing that, that energy. And then we regularly have a team meeting and those we try and keep them fun and upbeat. Um, we sometimes say, you know, everyone bring a gift at one point to one of the meetings. Um, and I try and bring a gift to every meeting. And that would be maybe um, I'd play one of my favorite dancey songs and I'd get everyone in the team dancing and cheering and kind of just getting into a place of like, it's six in the morning, everyone else is asleep. We've got to get this baby going how are we going to do that and make sure that everyone feels engaged and stoked to start the day even though there's still sleep in their eye and they've only had five hours sleep and they're a little bit pissed off but they're here and they're committed and you lean into that and you dance to uh, another one bites the dust by freddie mercury and by the end of it everyone's like pumped up and we can get into the meeting which really is more of an admin thing you know so before you get into the admin you you inspire and you get people rallied around what you're trying to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's really that's great, pretty, really pretty great tips, me. Misha. I love the idea of everyone bringing a gift because there's nothing like gifts to make people excited about mm. going somewhere. <laughs> I love that idea. Um, in terms of funding the festival, ideally you want to be able to fund it via ticket sales alone um, that would be the easiest thing to do and if you need money up front to pay for things before the festival starts which you definitely will selling early bird tickets will mean that you have money up front early bird tickets being ones that people buy you know a year in advance and they're slightly cheaper um, however if there are other avenues that you have available to you for external funding then that works as well um, and then there's the idea of sponsorship too so you could get certain elements sponsored by companies um, yeah that's we applied for a few grants to fund the added extra elements and we also had a one of our founders as a benefactor which really helped but yeah ideally you want to be able to sell the tickets to cover the costs Anything from your side on funding, Misha? Yeah, look, I think there's lots of ways that you can bring in funding, um, merchandise, um, you can get people to raise funds for the trees um, as a way to get tickets. We run this thing called Trees for Fees. So if you raise um, 10 trees, for instance, and the tree costs eight euros, um, and if someone reaches their goal, then they can get a ticket and you can kind of work out like, well, look, if we get a thousand trees raised this way, we know there's enough of enough fat on that to um, to pay for some of the ticket expenses and to pay for some of the, the tree planting expenses. Um, you already mentioned it, but, you know, having vendors, we generally have multiple vendors, like five or six vendors. So you can both save money through vendors by um, asking the vendors to contribute a certain amount of meals, which could go to bands and um, speakers and people like that, where you normally have to feed them. Um, and you can ask them to pay a fee um, for vending at your event. Um, merchandise is an option. It can be complicated and a lot of it gets ruined. But for instance, if you can get a kind of an outdoor company like a Patagonia to sponsor your team ticket, I mean, your team t-shirts, what you could do is 
ask them to do an overrun. So say there's 100 people on your team, um, do 100 green t-shirts and ask them to do 100 of another color and then participants could buy that other color. Um, and that way, you know, they're already setting up their machines to print your regeneration festival logo on a t-shirt. And um, it's a nice way to kind of add a, a gift and that's something you can sell up front. So you potentially don't even have to um, work out how many you want um, and, uh, and kind of do guesswork. When you sell the ticket, you can sell the t-shirt at the same time um, by asking people if they want to add that to the bill. Yeah. Nice idea. Patagonia did do that for our event. They gave us free t-shirts for our team. So I should have asked them. I didn't know <laughs> next time. So yeah, we're, we're taking the topic of selling tickets now. We did it through something called Ticket Tailor, which is an online ticket selling event. Um, there are different op options and you can just add this as a sort of plugin into your website or you just direct people to a specific page on the ticket selling website where they buy tickets from, from there. Uh, you need to consider whether you want to pay the VAT or whether you want to add the VAT onto the ticket price and extra uh, so that the, the ticket purchaser pays the VAT. Um, we had different tiers as well. So we had like low income, average income, high income. For the high income, we had, uh, I think it was called like Festival Friend or something where they paid more and then that subsidized the cost of the cheaper tickets. Um, and then we also created a deadline for buying tickets and limited ticket numbers on in each tier to stimulate interest and momentum. And then the early bird ticket that I discussed with you earlier to get people to buy them early so you have income to begin with before the festival planning really begins. I'm just going to go ahead and go to the next slide because I want there to be time for mm. questions. Marketing. Misha? Yeah, great. So, I mean, I think with marketing, it's, I almost hate the word marketing. I think, you know, to, to create awareness, to create momentum. Um, one of the, the, um, and you want to almost create that experience of um, when there's a sardine run and there's this energy that's on the ocean with all the fish moving. Um, and in order to do that, you really need to try and get as many people as possible to start talking about your event. Um, and there's lots of ways that you can do that. And some of the ways are effective and some of the ways are less effective. What I found works really well is getting the people in your community to speak about this and to hold it dear to them and communicate about it a lot. Um, you can use social media and you can use local media press. Um, you can make a video and put it on YouTube and share it around, but really getting people to talk about your event um, and getting your, your close community to be your ambassadors, I found works um, the best and working from where you're at. So, you know, for first event, you have a hundred people at the end of the event say, thank you. I love you. This worked so well. We achieved greatness. Will you be in my ambassadors for the next time we do this? And then the next time you do it, maybe you'll have 300 people because multiple of those people who are sufficiently inspired can then take your message and, and amplify it further by word of mouth, which is for me, the strongest way to market something. Um, and getting people to, to feel invested in it as if they found this new community, this community that believe in restoring the planet and not just, I saw an advert in a magazine and it looked interesting. Um, and you know, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll remember it or maybe I won't. That I think is it's less effective. Um, is it worth building a marketing plan? I'd say, yes, it is. Um, you know, there's so many ways that you can get it out there, but Finding, finding the methodology that's going to allow for it to, to create that kinetic energy, it's through voice, it's through uh, word of mouth, the, 
people who believe in what you believe in. Yeah, thank you. Cool. And then this one for me is quite an interesting one. I mean, I've done so many builds where I've been on site from the bitter beginnings and there's just been zero there. Um, uh, and for me, what's key is making sure you've picked the right team for the build, making sure you've got all the right tools to start that build efficiently. And lastly, making sure you look after yourself and your team from the start. You know, you could make a mistake of saying, we've just landed and now we're gonna build this big structure and that big structure and this kitchen and that, and not saying, how do we set up our own shop? How do we get to a place of feeling comfortable as a team so that if a big weather system moves in, we know we're healthy and we're happy and we're looked after and we're motivated to continue working regardless of the weather situation. So thinking about how does your rollout process go so that you ensure that both your team is taken care of and you go through the process of building everything else that's needed. Once you've taken care of your team, I'd say start with your major structures. And in fact, don't really bring any team in that are focused on decor or focused on admin or any of that. Leave them in the village, leave them in the city and allow for them to come in when it's necessary for them to come in. Start with those major structures, the things that are heavyweight things that are hard to put up and then eventually get uh, the more nuanced teams to come in who are doing art or decor or things that would plug into kind of this bigger build. Um, I highly recommend that you leave a day in between the start of the festival and the finish of the build. And in that day, you can both have some rest time, but you can also have some time to pause and go through all your health and safety stuff, go through all the stuff that's relevant to um, the flow of the weekend, um, introduce all your key people or even the whole team if you can. You know, if you have the time and energy for it, let's get everyone to feel like, I see you, I know who you are, and now I know how we're going to be relying on each other to ensure that this is a real success story. Um, and by doing so, you can create that unity. You can create that pause moment to allow for us all to see each other and to feel like we're going to achieve this together. Thank you. We're really nearly in the end now, everyone. Thank you so much. We've got a solid crew of people here that are still here. And uh, yeah, I've just been dreaming about 14. There's 14 of you here, 14 new restoration festivals being developed after this presentation. So yeah, fingers crossed for that. Um, before the event, I, the, I, full transparency, I wrote all of the text here. So I feel like I'm just gonna be reading it out. So it makes more sense for me, Cher, unless you're getting tired mm -hmm. to, to... No, no, that's fine. Yes. Um, so I think some of these I mentioned, you know, you know, you have a big staff check-in. I think that needs to happen every morning, but it's good to have something that, like a big one that runs through every element. You run through what happens in an emergency. You run through all the different captains and how their flow is. Um, the schedules of every day. You know, we have an op center and in that op center, you need to have on the wall, all the different things and all the different teams and how they're gonna be operating so that if someone didn't bring a notepad and pen, they know they can go to the op center, they can look on the wall, they say, okay, my shifts are there, there and there, and I know who I need to report to. And so it isn't a case that people are running around looking for these people, we know exactly who's supposed to be working where and how the, uh, the day is gonna unfold. Um, and then obviously we're about to put on a show and I think that's quite an exciting thought. And what happens before you put on a show, you almost need to test things. You need to go to the bar, you need to open the tap and make sure the beer is cold. You need to put the sound through the sound system and make sure that at the back, of, of uh, your, your arena space that it sounds crystal and it's delicious and it's coming through beautifully. You go to the, the gate and ask the people at the gate, are you feeling ready? Have you got your, your clear bag so that everyone who's gonna be getting one for their recycling um, knows what to do with it? Um, have you got some sort of welcome sign? Have you got all the things that are gonna allow for 
the full process because actually in putting on a show, you need to consider each part of the journey that people are going to be going through. And so it's important for you as the festival director to be able to live that journey. And what I generally do is once I've had my team meeting in the morning, then I'll have a restful walk through the sites. I'll go, I'll have lunch. And just before gates open, I will go right to the bottom of the festival site where the first car is going to enter. And I'll check that all the signs are still up. I'll check that all the flags are still up. I'll check that there is parking staff all the way from the bottom. And I will walk the first car through the entire journey and make sure that everyone who's communicating anything about parking and entrance and ticketing and health and safety stuff and getting their bags and their tents to their um, respective camping sites and landing in the festival feels held and that everyone feels like they know what they're doing. And I'd say you do that a few times. Don't be in a position where you feel like, ah, it's working perfectly. People change shifts. Money disappears because there's a money box and the door's not open anymore. And, you know, keep your finger on the pulse of the festival as much as the restoration. Excellent advice. Yeah. And then during the event, you, it's, it's a good idea what we did at, Regen Fest was there was a different member of the core team each day who had a shift and then during their shift they were the one that was generally doing the production so they had they knew who their team were for that day or for that period of the day they'd have a check-in with them at, them at the beginning make sure everyone knows what they're doing there would be a clipboard so you'd know where each member of your team was in terms of the workshop areas, the camping, the, the registration, et cetera. You all had walkie talkies. Um, so yeah, that's how we managed. And then you made sure you do a clean hang, handover, hangover, <laughs> handover with the, uh, with the people that are following after you for the next shift. Making sure there's high quality photography and videography happening throughout the event is really important. This incredible shot here, uh, we hired a local photographer and we put that into the budget. So again, creating more local jobs. Um, and then we had amazing promotional photography to use after the event uh, to sell. Well, we didn't do another one, but <laughs> if we do, we, can, we have the photos available. Same with videography. We had someone um, who made a promotional film. Uh, these are all really great promotional materials for the, for the event moving forward for journalists to use when they are coming to write articles etc um yeah games to keep the energy high like misha said and that's all that i have to say on that <laughs> misha anything else to add no i think we can speak to it after the event yeah Cool. Ash, should I go ahead or would you like to, to start this one? Cool. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a critical thing to realize that that decompression is held really well. And that decompression should happen from a few hours before um, people start packing up. It's um, trying to understand how were people's experiences. So making sure that you've got some sort of form that people can fill in right there and then. You had a couple of volunteers walking around saying, this is how my experience is. This is how it could be improved. These are my highlights. It's reiterating that it's a waste-free festival and that people need to take uh, their rubbish home or they need to recycle it on site. Um, and then it's also seeing how you can create support for your team. You know, we've, uh, most years, we put it out, we put a big sign that says, volunteer for your last meal, help us with a strike. And if we had 30 people on our team eh, on the last day, we might get another 30 people who really just don't wanna leave just yet. They've had a magic experience. They'd like to add more value. They, they don't wanna feel like, oh, no, I've got to go. I've just really had such a great time here. And so you can open the door again. You can say, here's a window. 
would you like to stay for another meal? Would you like to stay for the last night? It'll be just team. We'll be enjoying the last of the beers. We, we've got some extra food. You're welcome to join us, but please participate in the strike. And then that extra energy of people who haven't been there for 10 days before comes in. They're still inspired by all the planting and they can bring a little bit of extra value. Um, and then post the events, you know, uh, we try and track as much as possible. So we try and track how many people, uh, how much um, recycling was done, how much um, organic material was composted, um, you know, how much solar energy did we capture, pretty much every statistic we can get, trees planted, you name it. We get all the stats and we make a really lovely diagram, which we can then send to the sponsors and the partners and the participants to say, success, you were part of this. Thank you. It's easy to consume. Um, you can see the impact and you can see it from an events perspective too. Mm -hmm. I think what's so beautiful about a restoration festival and events is it's immersive beyond anything else. The festivals have the opportunity to really capture you. You know, it's a it's a temporary community. Um, I think most people have this vision of living in a in a an intentional community one day, living surrounded by the people that have si similar ideals and ethics as themselves. And so, to host a restoration festival of a hundred or a few hundred people, a thousand people, what you're doing is you're creating the social experiment to bring a lot of people together and make magic happen and test boundaries. And so, it's your job as a curator, as a director, to create that journey, to balance it out, to make people feel inspired, held safe, to capture that imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very special opportunity hosting a restoration festival and it takes a lot of thoughts and curating. And yeah, you've got to kind of work out how to channel those people through that journey and get them to be in a place of, of feeling like they're gonna leave and say that was the, one of the best moments of my life because it can be, it really can be. Yeah. Thanks Ash, thanks to everyone. That was great, I really enjoyed that. Nice to share <laughs> with everyone. Yeah, I feel like we captured so many golden nuggets of experience and advice here. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can all see each other after nearly uh, an hour of, an hour? What time we start? Four, an hour and a half. Um, yeah, so questions. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask any of us? I realize that it's quite late now. So if, if people need to run, then go for it. But we're still hanging on in here for anyone that wants to ask anything or say anything or just inspire us with the festivals that you're planning to do. Yeah, we, uh, we'd like to hear from you basically. Why did you come? Why is, why is this an in interesting to you? <laughs> shoot us a um, question i just have to say oh i'm on two screens here <laughs> i am inspired by all of this it's really um like the point is to get people to understand how possible this is this greater movement of ecosystem restoration and i'm totally down with making it fun <laughs> um, I, of course, I have a thousand questions and I know they're not going to get answered here, but you know, it, it requires like on the scale that I think you're talking about, um, it feels like it really requires some professionals, you know, like some people that I might know that have done this before, you know, I, I feel like this is, but let me ask about scale. Let's say the smallest scale worth doing what do you consider um where that economy of scales might work out in the country also in los angeles an urban center <laughs> uh, I yeah go ashley yeah i think it would depend on 
on what it is that you're doing it for i mean are you doing it to make money because if you are then doing it on a larger scale makes more sense are you doing it because you want to have a wonderful time with your community in which case doing it on a smaller scale makes sense um wherever you're doing it depending on the size of the land um and the permits and permissions that you need and the costs that will dictate to you what what sort of scale makes sense anyway we did an event for 80 people in London just for the day and we organized we did I think we met maybe like once every two weeks for an hour none of us were really very professional and we put on much more of what felt like a community event um we didn't make any money out of it we covered our costs but what we wanted was to bring a lot of people into the river roading project which some friends of mine who were in the team had started they wanted more people to know about it they wanted to show the local council that there was a real interest in it that was the that was the purpose you know so yeah. i think it's the purpose and the context that should dictate what scale makes sense to you i mean just speaking up off the top of my head, this is a new idea for us to consider. So we're on a kind of a reconnaissance mission. And I think I just first off want to thank you guys, Ashley and Misha, you did a great job of just laying it out. I've got four pages of notes here <laughs> a deck to like, you know, show who might get enrolled, all the things that need to be thought about. Um, but the, um, you know, our mission would really be twofold, I'd say. One, to really get some work done on the land where this would happen. And two is to just create a sense of awareness around the issue and making it fun with food and music is the way to go, is really, you know, that's our part of our, our model. You've muted yourself, Johnny. Sorry about that. Um, I, I won't hog the space if there's anybody else who has questions, um, but if they don't, my next question would be like the ratio of des uh, designing uh, the work to the fun, let's say. The yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't want it to be too much of a just come and work thing because we didn't, unlike Misha's context of working in a forest we were working on a farm and so we were mainly working around the peripheries of the farm fields so therefore we didn't need to plant tens of thousands of, of plants uh, and we wanted there to be lots of discussion happening between the people that were coming um, and to showcase what the region was all about uh, so that's why we chose to have just two and a half hours of restoration in the morning and then workshops in the afternoon. But like with Misha's context, he had a lot, a lot more space um, and, a, and a larger restoration mission. So, yeah. Do you want to say something, Misha? Why did no, you choose to you... have it the whole day, the restoration work? So, I mean... Yeah, I mean, the reality is it still got quite hot for us. Um, what we found was we were doing arrive on a Friday, plant all day Saturday, plant some of Sunday. Everyone hated me by the end. So very fast learned that that was not an option. And then what we did is we say, OK, well, let's plant on the Saturday, finish at lunch, have a fun lunch, bring some music in, get high energy and then invite people to come back and plant again after lunch if they would like to. What would often happen, people would only arrive sometimes uh, at, on Saturday um, mid-morning and so they would miss the planting anyway. And so there was often another group and then there was you know, a bunch of birdie people who just like, I came for the planting, I wanna really get as much planting in as possible and they would come back. Mm -hmm. And we'd also have a target which we would have already assumed based on how many people are coming. We'd say, okay, look, we know we can get X amount of trees per this many people, let's set this target so people have an aspiration to achieve that. And then the Sunday would be the sacred day of learning and sharing and forest walks and being a restful day. 
um, with no planting. The only time we'd ever do planting on a Sunday is if like one of our partners came and they wanted to do like a ceremonious thing just independently and we could facilitate that. Um, maybe it was like a, a woman's day or a mother's day. We might have a woman's circle and have one of the woman elders come and you know she could say something. We plant an independent tree. Maybe a child's just been born. So you could do something that like brings a tree planting element to the next day, but it's not this kind of hard work, high energy rigmarole. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of hands. Elizabeth. Elizabeth was one of the members of the team for the Regeneration Festival. Yes. <laughs> nice to see you here now. Likewise, it's been a long time. I know. <laughs> but thank you so much for your presentation. It was super insightful. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have two questions. Uh, one of them is uh, regarding like the legal matter, like how you structure yourself. Are you an NGO or company or how do you work that out? What are the pros and cons into both uh, being a nonprofit or being a company? Hmm. I'm happy to answer that. Uh, it's a complicated one um, sometimes. So in our instance, we have two businesses. One is a uh, an NPC, non-for-profit company. And there we host the tree planting. We fund trees, education, environmental education. We bring low income youth to come tree planting. On this side, we run a business, which we position as a social enterprise. It can get sponsorship. It can sell tickets, which is a revenue generating activity and it can complement this. So we don't draw a profit from here you know there's no dividends here it's really a service provider to this it's you know having tents and trucks and um, marketing teams in an ngo didn't seem like it was diverting the energy of my programs team who are really just trying to focus on ensuring impact so we split them out and we work on it like that. And it seems to have worked quite well for us. Mm, nice. Thank you. And then the other question is, so if you go to one place that is not in your local community, like how do you reach out and how do you make the local connection mm. with that place? Like what are the challenges and some insights that you have gotten? I mean, there's just an infinite amount of challenges that could come up um, and anecdotally between language barriers and some people who just do not like trees, uh, you know, because they believe it's for agriculture or maybe for religious reasons, God plants trees, people don't plant trees. You know, there's, it's just a whole spectrum. Um, and my experience has been that you just need good community participation process. You need to go there without too much of an agenda I've never been anywhere without being invited. Hmm. Someone, there's a reason why it's just like, I'm going to go and plant trees in the Amazon because I've heard the Amazon's buggered. And that hasn't, that's not what I, my agenda would be. I've been invited somewhere. I would get the person who's invited me to say, can we set up a meeting with your local municipality, with some of the local NGOs, with anyone who's got an interest in restoration, um, with, yeah, a, a network of people and let's have a cup of tea together and let's sit in a circle and let's talk about what is their vision, where are their challenges, how can we amplify the work that they're doing already so that it's not my story and my agenda, so that it becomes a collective story, a collective narrative. We can all believe in a similar journey and then you're going to come from a real place of strength. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how we've tried to do it. You know, we my uh, my interns hate me for it but we i don't like printing marketing material for an event so we create a blackboard and we hand paint every single logo in black and white so the, the each logo is just white just so that it's not like this corporate christmas tree of partners and because there's so many partners there's just hundreds of them um, and it's really by virtue of saying like let's try and get as many people as invited as possible and find 
where their niche is, find the gap, find the thing that makes that speaks to them and makes them feel invested in it. Most people want trees, you know, most people want to see ecosystems being restored. You just need to find where the connection point is. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. It's very yeah, sure. insightful. And can we have your email if you want? Yeah, to sure. I'll put it in the chat. In the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Where the local people are concerned as well, like with the Regeneration Festival and with the, the Positive Trace Party we did in London, we made sure that the the team, the core team, had people that lived in the area on the team and we'd created a paid job or paid jobs for them so that they automatically told all their friends and family, all the people that live around the area about their new exciting job and they were automatically inviting all their friends and family to come. We made sure that uh, as many of the people as possible that were providing services were again from the local area, stimulating more jobs. And that, like Misha said, just word of mouth, the person who works at the local sound engineering company, he tells all his friends and family. And then all of a sudden we went into the local town like two weeks before, we went into the hardware shop and they were like, oh, are you from that festival? And they were all really excited about it. So allow the festival to champion the local place as much as possible so that everyone just feels really proud of the fact that it's there and that it's they see it as a really good thing for, for that place and the people that live there. I can see a little, I think that's a comment rather than a question. Uh, does anyone else want to ask anything? I'm aware that we've been going for quite a while now, um, so I'm happy to draw things to a close, unless anyone has any more questions. I'd, I'd be happy to end with something just uh, to stimulate some imagination. Um, did you build hydrants? Uh, are you, is that for me? I think it's about when you said make sure you have fire hydrants available. Okay, fire, we, fire extinguishers or fire hydrants, uh, the, the name is interchangeable, yeah. Um, I've had the privilege of kind of connecting with a lot of big European and, um, and UK festivals around trying to get them to a place of being uh, invested in the restoration festival. Um, arena and I think that there's definitely hope well in the future hopefully an opportunity for us to see conventional festivals have a, a almost like a breakaway and move towards being a restoration festival you know, we have overseas with 80,000 people and much of it is kind of dystopian destruction and just having a good old laugh but there's so much energy and there's so much money spent. And I really believe that there's a huge opportunity for us as this collective to start filling the space, to start filling that void. Um, and I'm already getting a lot of interest. You know, I'm, I've been speaking to um, Glastonbury Festival and Medicine Festival and quite a lot of the festivals that are, start, are really switching on to the idea that we need to make that shift. Um, and my hope is that you know, maybe this is a team that we could go to a festival and say, you know, let's convert it from this um, kind of drunken brawl to something that's more in line with supporting functionality in these communities of, of ecosystems and individuals. So we can restore individuals and get people to a place where they, we can go to a festival, we can have a drink, but that doesn't mean to say that it, it needs to be a place we lose ourselves. It can be a place where we really find ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally echo that. I think it's actually made me realize that it, it's quite a big thing to organize one of these festivals. It takes a lot of time, a lot, mm. of, lot of time and energy. It's totally worth it. But if you've never done it before, maybe it'll be worth trying to find another event that's going on in your area and ask them if you can bring a restoration activity and initiative to that event as a way for you to practice um to get your name known just to introduce the idea of doing a restoration as part of a festival um yeah i think that that would 
be a good idea before you launch into trying to organize a whole big event yourself, which could feel like a big leap from zero to 10. Anyway, oh yeah, uh, Susan. I just wanted to say that when we did our first ecosystem restoration camp here in Paradise, California, um, it kind of turned into a music festival anyway. You know, at night, you know, there was, we were all around a campfire and, and guitars came out and stuff. And so, it, you know, it would be better, I think, to plan it that way. <laughs> and then the quality of the music would be better. <laughs> Well, it's nice. Um, <laughs> and I didn't know that you were with with Camp Paradise. I, we haven't met before. Hi. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. It's nice to meet you too. Thank you for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. It was a lot of fun. Um, Conan, using the raise your hand function. Using the raise my hand button. I am. Um, I'm an environment officer at the local hand local local hand local small arts festival, and um, oh, cool. that sort of didn't happen this year or last year, and. Yeah, now that we've joined the ecosystem restoration camps thing as well, and just actually to pick up on what Susan said, we had a couple of volunteers around, and yeah, the same thing happened in the last couple of weeks. So it, it is something that kind of takes on a life of itself. Mm -hmm. Just about what you were saying, Misha, about um, trying to like, piggyback or combine a small festival or a big festival into a restoration festival. I'm wondering how would how you start to go about that? I, I just being the environment officer at a festival is very much about uh, trying to manage waste and trying to educate people. And it sort of fit, feels almost like a losing battle. Mm -hmm. But this sort of thing really inspires me into, yeah, it's planting trees or it's educating people on a more uh, inspiring sort of level rather than trying to get them to, getting them to put the plastic in the right place. You know, it's, it's a different level. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the thing is, it's a it's a cultural shift in its entirety. And so you need to have the right nudges in place. And those nudges come with either incentives, so very clearly defined bins in very open places that ensures people can see what's going on. And potentially there's some sort of incentive like Viva Canagua. You know, if you put your plastic cup, someone's going to get a euro um, for a water project. Um, mm. uh, I think it helps if you also reduce the amount of pressure on the festival goers. So, you know, if they have to pay for their cup and when it gets returned, um, or if it's just a case of like everything that comes out of the festival um, that's been produced is compostable and then it can all go into to the same place. Um, uh, I mean, it's easy enough for me to say we're running a festival and we're calling it a zero waste festival nothing goes to landfall when there's only a thousand people but that for me has been a, a process of taking people on an extended journey you know we start off with yeah. pre-communication we're doing it through social media as people arrive at the gate they're made very aware it's a zero waste festival we stop all the music regularly and say okay what can you see around you? Can you see a cup? Can you see a bottle? Let's put it in the right bins. Everyone get busy. And so people feel like they're, they've taken on this journey and each iteration of the journey, they're getting reminded that this is a collective responsibility. Yeah. When it gets yeah. to 10,000 people, about, 20, people, it's obviously a lot harder. I'm thinking about trying to shift just the people that we've got already, like that are managing the festival, that are running the teams and, and trying to yeah. get them to maybe shift into using this format that you spoke about there and to running something like planting trees as well and to really take mm -hmm. on the, the restoration element of it as well and to, mm -hmm. yeah, to give over part of the program to work in a way as well. So, yeah, maybe you have thoughts, okay. Ashley. So I've been asked by, have you heard of Boom Festival in Portugal? It's like a huge one. Uh, right. I've been asked by a friend who works on the main team to think about bringing restoration elements into there and that's like such a would be such a huge opportunity and possibility the festival's in the summer though so and it's quite a dry arid place so i don't think tree planting would really be very possible unless you brought in potted trees and it would be really hard um to do but 
the ideas I've had for like weaving restoration into a normal festival are in other possibilities of activities you could do, like making compost, making compost tea, applying these things, making, um, teaching people about hydrology and water catchments and but digging earthworks together because there'll be lots of hands and spades. There could be some seeds that are ready for collection. Again, it really depends on the time of year. Uh -huh. um you could do talks you could have like a specific color so in the schedule of workshops every one that's marked or colored green is about restoration um you could have talks uh there could be bands that sing songs about it just look at all the different elements of the festival and how you can weave something about restoration in it doesn't just have to be people digging or watering or whatever it can be inspiration mm. via poetry music speakers etc susan i just wanted to piggyback on too and say that uh, one of the features that could be added would be like an, uh, an open mic you know because i, I think um uh, a lot of people would love to share their their music as, as i was saying before and it and um i've hosted open mics for like 17 years and it's really amazing how um supportive an audience can be for people who are getting up on the stage that aren't professional musicians, you know, and and, um, and, and that's a, a dimension I think that, you know, you can challenge people to do songs that are appropriate to the theme of the festival. So that's, a, that's an idea too. Nice, yeah. Cool. Well, I'd like to draw it to a close now. Um, I have something else I need to do relatively soon and would like a comfort break whatnot you can see my face I'm really getting a bit tired but it was a wonderful conversation and I'm glad that we managed to inspire and teach you and let us know if you plan to create a restoration festival of your own or activities within an existing one um, we'd feel very enthused and buoyed up by such news I think um, yeah, Misha, did you want to pop your email in the chat, if you're happy to? Mm, yeah, I did. Okay, great. And those it's who already the, have... Uh, MishaGreenPub.org. Yeah. And I will send the slides to the people who asked tomorrow, and the recording will go on YouTube, and feel free to share it with whoever and you like. Cool, thank you. Bye, everybody. Cheers, all. Nice chatting. Thank you so much. Sure, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.